Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers de facto arrests, warrantless vehicle searches, and body camera policies, and is brought to us by KTVU Fox 2 San Francisco's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On the morning of September 20th, 2019, Nevada resident Asili Lagervale and her daughters, Asili and Ate, arrived in Castro Valley, California after driving through the night so that Asili and Ate could attend their college classes. Ms. Lagervale parked her rental vehicle in a handicapped parking space with a visible placard on the rearview mirror in a parking lot outside of a Starbucks location. The Lagervales were resting in the vehicle and preparing to enter the Starbucks to get coffee and use the restroom when Deputy Stephen Holland and Deputy Monica Pope of the Alameda County Sheriff's Office approached the vehicle. The interaction that followed was captured on Deputy Holland's body camera. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. What are you guys doing here? Uh, waiting to go to Starbucks in a second. Why? Oh, we have, is there a problem? We can't, well, can't so, sit here? Well, actually, let me tell you why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been having auto break-ins in this parking lot every okay. morning around this time. Thank you very much. So, I've been, so I've been driving around here. Okay. okay. And I noticed that you guys aren't doing nothing but hanging out. Yeah, I just got in from and Vegas. So, Okay, well that's morning. I've been driving all night. Okay. It takes well, eight hours to get here. Well relax. That's my reason why I'm talking to you. I'm from here, so I'm, I'm not okay. just, this is a we're in a car from the Bay Area from Oakland. It's not I'm a not, Nevada I'm, car. No, I'm not in Nevada. I'm okay. not I'm from You have your Oakland. ID on you? Yeah. Okay, so wait a minute. Now why are you asking for my ID? You just explained to me about the break in. Right. But why did you explain to me about the um, my ID? What did I do? What kind of crime did I commit? What kind of crime did you commit? Yeah. I'm asking well, you, you, you have to ask you for my ID. Yeah, you have to give me your ID. Why do I have to give you my ID? I don't have to give you my ID because I haven't did anything. You you started talking about a break-in. Okay. I thank you for telling, informing me that. Right. I informed you that I'm resting because I'm about to go into Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. I informed you I've been driving all night, right? Well, Starbucks has been open for about two hours. It's actually been open since five. I checked my um, GPS. Okay. okay. Are you doing anything wrong? No, I'm not. So then what's the big deal? I don't have to give you my ID. I'm not doing anything uh, wrong. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. I know the law. I don't have to give you my ID. I'm not doing anything wrong. Deputy Holland orders Ms. Lagervale to show him her ID, and Ms. Lagervale argues that she does not have to provide identification because she has not done anything wrong. California does not have a stop and identify statute that criminally sanctions an individual's refusal to identify themselves to the police during a lawful Terry stop. And even if it did, it is likely that a court would conclude that the officers did not have reasonable suspicion to detain Ms. Lagervale and her daughters on suspicion of the alleged vehicle break-ins, as the officers later revealed that the suspects in these incidents were were black males, and Ms. Lagervale clearly explained that she and her daughters were about to go into Starbucks. Section 12951 of the California Vehicle Code states that the driver of a vehicle, quote, shall have the valid driver's license issued to him or her in his or her immediate possession at all times when driving a motor vehicle upon a highway, and, quote, shall present his or her license for examination upon demand of a peace officer enforcing the provisions of this code. However, while Ms. Lagervale was parked in in her vehicle, she was not driving, and it is clear from the interaction that Deputy Holland was not attempting to enforce the vehicle code, but was instead investigating Ms. Lagervale and her daughters for potential criminal conduct. Likewise, Section 22511.56 of the California Vehicle Code requires that an individual using a disabled placard, like Ms. Lagervale was, quote, shall, upon request of a peace officer, present identification and evidence of the issuance of that placard to that person. Here, Deputy Holland did did not request evidence pertaining to the issuance of the placard. Instead, he only requested Ms. Lagervale's identification, and did so in the context of investigating the vehicle break-ins rather than confirming the validity of Ms. Lagervale's placard. Therefore, a court would likely determine that Ms. Lagervale was not required to show identification to Deputy Holland in this situation. So, I'm not doing anything wrong. So what you're doing now is leading me to believe that you might be doing something wrong. No, I'm not doing that, so don't try to trump up no charges. I, I saw like get your phones out, so I recorded. Why are you getting so worked up? Because I gotta have protection. Because I don't okay. know where this is about to go. I well, gotta have protection. Well, it's not gonna go anywhere if you cooperate. Anything. Everything's being recorded. Exactly, and I'm not doing anything. That's what did you hear me tell my daughters? Start recording as well. So why are you making this a big deal? This can be a completely positive encounter. Exactly. Okay? I'm not going to give you my ID because I haven't done anything. Do you have a valid driver's license? Yes, I do. So are you going to refuse to give me your ID? I am because I haven't done anything. Call your superior. Call your supervisor. I don't have to do that. Yes, you do have to do that. 
Make sure you record that because I'm going as soon as I leave here, I'm going to 150th and I'm going to the um, sheriff's department. We're being harassed for nothing. It's not harassment. Well, yes, it is harassment. Dude. Well, guess what? No. I, I'm not in any rush. I can hang out here till you want to give me your ID. I'm not. I want you to call your sheriff. I want you to call me or call your um, superior. I sell it. Um, um, what, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Call 911. Call 911. What, what, what is I'm going on here? No, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Okay, everyone in this car is detained. You can go back in the car and wait. Or, or you can go in handcuffs and go in my car. Okay, sit in the car or you're going in handcuffs. I'm not dealing with this. I'm going in handcuffs because I have to use directions. You can sit, you can sit. Last chance, sit in the car or you're going in handcuffs. Yeah, that's what, what? Yeah, that's what? That was one of the things. You're being a really too assessive right about now. You're being real assessive right now. That's okay. one of the reasons why we okay. stopped here too. For me to get coffee and I was telling her to get up so she could go to the restroom. You're not going to do that. You're not going to violate and victimize us. They don't want to okay. listen to us, so let's go ahead and okay. detain these two. No, you're not going to detain them. We haven't did anything. We haven't. We have not did anything. Call let's start the car. Get out of the car. No, I'm not. Get out of the car. 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 I'm the window down. I'll get out. Just don't, don't pull on me. I'll get out. All right, get out of the car. This is your last chance to get out of the car or I'm placing you. No, you're not placing me under arrest. Or I'm placing you under arrest. I'm calling someone. Get out of the car. I am. You don't have to pull me. I'm getting out now. Then get out. Stop it. Then get out. Stop it. Stand right here. Put your hands behind your back. You're being detained. No, I'm not being detained. For what? I'm you're being detained. For what? Put your hand behind your back or you're going to go to jail. No, I'm not going to jail. We get an attorney right now. Record everything. We get an attorney. You're not following any of my instructions. We haven't done anything. Don't worry. Don't worry. That's what I'm saying. Put your hands behind your back or you're going to jail. Put your hands behind your back or you're going to jail. Don't worry. That's fine. We have a lawsuit. Um, excuse me, officer. Can you can you make some sense out of this? We haven't did any. We haven't did we're anything. For. And all of a sudden, we're getting arrested. I don't have stop, a weapon stop. on me. I'm just I asked checking. for his superior, his supervisor. I asked for a supervisor. Grab a seat. This is not how things work, ma'am. No, what are you talking about? This is we haven't did anything. Take your feet you, you don't demand what we do. No, I, I'm not demanding anything. The officers handcuff all three of the logger veils and place them in the back of separate police vehicles, claiming that they are being detained and not arrested, and hold them for about an hour. Although an officer putting an individual in handcuffs and placing them in the back of a police vehicle does not automatically convert a Terry stop detention into an arrest, there are situations where the circumstances of a seizure can transform it from a Terry stop, which only needs to be supported by reasonable suspicion, to a so-called de facto arrest, which must be supported by probable cause. In other words, it is unconstitutional for an officer to detain an individual under circumstances that constitute an arrest without probable cause, even if the officer claims they are only detaining them. When determining whether a seizure rose to the level of an arrest, courts consider factors including the scope, intrusiveness, and duration of the detention. In the 2022 case of United States v. Guerrero, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over California, affirmed the denial of motion to suppress because two of the three judges on the panel concluded that the seizure of the defendant was constitutionally reasonable, albeit for different reasons. Each judge filed a separate opinion on the issue, with Circuit Judge Gould arguing that the one-hour seizure, quote, was more than a brief detention akin to a Terry stop, because, quote, in combination, the length of the detention and the use of handcuffs under the circumstances transformed Guerrero's detention into a de facto arrest. On the other hand, while ultimately concluding that Guerrero's seizure was reasonable, Circuit Judge B argued that he he was not subject to a de facto arrest. However, Judge B's interpretation of the situation was based on the fact that the detention was only prolonged to wait for investigators from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to arrive, which Judge B found to be a reasonable delay based on past Ninth Circuit precedent. Because, like Guerrero, the Lagervales were held in handcuffs and police cars for approximately one hour, and their detention was not prolonged to await the arrival of specialized federal officers, they would have a strong argument that the circumstances of their detainment transformed a Terry stop into an arrest. And while it is unlikely that the officers even had the reasonable suspicion necessary to conduct a Terry stop, it is nearly indisputable that they did not have probable cause to make any arrests.
Deputy Holland opens the rental vehicle door and appears to search at least one bag which was located inside the sedan. Later in this interaction, the officers search the entire vehicle, including the trunk and all three Lagervales' purses, and obtain their identification cards. In general, the Fourth Amendment requires officers to obtain a warrant before searching a vehicle. However, there are several exceptions to this warrant requirement, and officers typically have the authority to conduct a warrantless search of a vehicle with the valid consent of the driver or owner, as required by exigent circumstances, incident to a lawful arrest, and when they have probable cause that the vehicle contains evidence of criminal activity. Significantly, these exceptions do not authorize the search of a vehicle to obtain an individual's identification when they refuse to provide it. Although there may be an argument that such a search would be permitted in situations where the refusal to identify constitutes a criminal offense. Although the Supreme Court of California upheld the, quote, limited search of the glove compartment, the area underneath the driver's seat, and the area beneath the front passenger seat for an individual's identification when the individual refused to identify themselves and the officer, quote, was preparing to issue a traffic citation and therefore needed to learn the true identity of the person to be cited in the 2002 case of Inre Arturo D., none of the Lagervales were being cited for a traffic violation in this situation. Notably, although the Arturo D. case was considered good law at the time this encounter occurred, it was later overruled in the 2019 case of People v. Lopez, where the Supreme Court of California recognized that California was the only state to have recognized, quote, an exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement for suspicionless traffic stop vehicle searches, and that, quote, the desire to obtain a driver's identification following a traffic stop does not constitute an independent categorical exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. Accordingly, as the officers did not search the vehicle under a recognized exception to the warrant requirement, a court would almost certainly conclude that the search of the vehicle was unconstitutional. Where's your driver's license at? It's in my wallet. Okay, which one's that? It's my black wallet. The black wallet? Is that in the purse that was right by your feet? It, yes, it is. Okay. Well, I'm going admin. Well, admin? I talk to my partners. Farrell, what is going on? After muting the sound on his body camera, Deputy Holland discusses the situation with Deputy Pope and the other officers that responded to the scene. According to the Alameda County Sheriff's Office General Order Number 8.17, officers in the department may use mute mode, quote, in extended video situations, including search warrants, housing unit searches, and investigative activities where no suspect interaction is occurring. However, the policy requires that, quote, for any mute mode activation for an extended operation, supervised approval must be sought. Additionally, the policy states that mute mode may also be useful when audio recording should be deactivated, quote, based on articulable reasons, such as sensitive intelligence gathering, when discussing sensitive tactical or confidential law enforcement information, or other investigative purposes. The policy also requires that, quote, when utilizing mute mode, members shall verbally announce they are placing the camera in mute mode prior to activating the feature. That, quote, the reason for this activation will be re reasonably announced as well, and that, quote, absent an extended video situation with supervisor approval, or an incident where the member has determined audio recording may be stopped based on articulable reasons, mute mode shall not be used. It is clear that Deputy Holland's use of mute mode on his body camera in this situation does not comply with this policy. However, it should be noted that the current body camera policy was last revised in December of 2022, and a version of the body camera policy from 2017 did not include these provisions on the use of mute mode. Therefore, it is unclear when these requirements went into effect, and it is possible that when this interaction occurred in 2019, the policy may not have prohibited Deputy Holland's use of his body camera's mute feature. As we discussed earlier in this episode, the officers searched the vehicle, including the Lagervales' purses and the vehicle's trunk, and obtained the Lagervales' identification cards. During this search, Deputy Holland's body camera remained muted. The officers held the Lagervales for about an hour, and then released them without finding filing any charges. The Lagervales allege that they suffered abrasions on their arms and wrists from the incident. On July 14, 2020, the Lagervales filed a lawsuit against the officers involved in the encounter and the Alameda County Sheriff's Office for assault, battery, false arrest, and a violation of constitutional rights, among other allegations. On March 1, 2023, a federal jury unanimously ruled in favor of the Lagervales and awarded them a total of $8.25 million in damages. Specifically, 
Eventually, the jury held Deputy Holland and Alameda County jointly liable to Asili for $2.75 million in damages and to Ayate and Asili for $2 million each. The jury also held Deputy Pope and Alameda County jointly liable to Ayote and Asili for $750,000 each. As of the time of writing this episode, the Alameda County Sheriff's Office has not announced any disciplinary action against Deputy Holland or Deputy Pope. In fact, both deputies have been promoted since this incident occurred. Overall, the Alameda County deputies get an F for ordering Ms. Lagervale to show her identification when she was most likely not required to do so, unconstitutionally detaining the Lagervales without reasonable suspicion or probable cause, unnecessarily using handcuffs and placing the Lagervales in the back of police vehicles, and searching the rental vehicle in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Although I cannot know the deputy's motivations for certain, given the fact that Deputy Holland claimed to be investigating a string of break-ins involving male subjects, it seems logical to conclude that he only detained the Lagervales for standing up for their rights and refusing to comply with his unlawful demand for identification. Handcuffing the Lagervales and placing them in the back seats of cruisers was excessive, and appeared to be a punitive reaction to the Lagervales' refusal to cooperate. Although Deputy Holland was the primary offender, Deputy Pope and the other officers who responded to the scene still get an F for going along with Deputy Holland's unreasonable and illegal actions, and likely violating the Constitution themselves in the process. The Lagervales get an A for refusing to surrender to the officer's unconstitutional demands for identification, firmly and, for the most part, respectfully advocating for their constitutional rights, and taking prompt and effective legal action against the officers involved in this encounter. It is highly unusual for these types of cases to go to a jury trial, as they are typically resolved via settlement before the lawsuit progresses to the trial phase. And the fact that this case was heard by a jury allowed the Lagervales to receive a public verdict declaring that their rights had been violated without any sort of non-disclosure agreement preventing the public from learning of the Alameda County officer's misconduct. While I'm unsure of the reason this case did not settle, I commend the Lagervales for their patience and their commitment to obtaining justice through the often slow-moving U.S. legal system, and would encourage others who have had their rights violated by the police to learn from their example. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.